Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDSC WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Kathy Annette, President and CEO of the Blandin Foundation, who has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. Thank you. So you loom very large, the foundation looms very large in strengthening civil society in various ways in this region. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you do that. And it's not just through grant making, which you do. Mm -hmm. You also provide other types of support as well. We certainly do. The majority of what we do is grant making. However, we also have programs that have contributed greatly to rural Minnesota communities. For example, we have a leadership program and we have trained over 7,000 people in rural Minnesota communities over the past couple of decades in terms of rural leadership. And, and that's so important because although having means, getting a check, is, is really critical to the services that are shaped and delivered by these nonprofits, it's also the competency of the people to ensure that those services are delivered in a quality way. So how do you actually do this? When you say you, you do training, talk about how those training programs unfold. The training programs are first well-designed programs to bring 26 people from a community together for an entire week. And they spend the entire week together learning to get to know each other and picking up a number of skills, both as individuals and leaders, but even more importantly, as a group, as a cohort. What can we do back home to make a change? So that is how we, we really do this, is bring up 26 people together for a week to go through a concentrated, really excellent leadership program. In addition to that, we follow up with them with workshops over a year, and we give them grants to accomplish some of the work that they identify together as a group. What's remarkable about this is you form peers, you form friends, you form others who know how to do this work with you. And those that are really successful keep at this once they get home. And your movement building, right? That's, that, that's the whole idea. It, it comes from a place of respect. Respect that people within a community have their own solutions, they have their knowledge. They might lack some other knowledge which you're helping them to build. But those solutions are gonna come from within the community. Absolutely, in fact, the work that we do in many ways comes from community. We listen to communities. We listen when communities tell us for our small rural communities to be successful, we have to have access to high-speed internet. We looked at this over 10 years ago, the broadband program that we have. We don't go in and do it for any community because you can't. Communities do it for themselves, but how can we best support you as you look at developing these programs, these ways of doing business um, accessing broadband, for example, to make a difference. Now, you've referred a number of times to particular, uh, the particular needs of rural communities. Could you talk a little bit about that, th those needs? And then let's really delve into that, because the needs of rural communities are far different than, uh, than communities that are in or proximate to a city. They are. Rural needs, geography makes a difference. Uh, um, a certain distance makes a difference. Weather makes a difference. Weather makes a difference, particularly for us in Minnesota, correct? One of the things we do is we ask. We do this through a rural pulse study that we do every two to three years, and it's a perception study where we ask rural community members, what's important to you and what are some of the things you identify? And consistently, consistently things like jobs and the economy come up, other things that seem to have emerged are health and the opioid addiction and crises that many of these rural communities are facing. Mental health has really emerged as one of the top areas of concern for our communities. So what we do is we say, how can we best assist these communities? Leadership is, is one way. Really looking at engaging communities in conversations is another. So one of the um, skills and talents and things that we really have out there is how do you br create a space, bring people together to have really courageous conversations about some of these issues that are really important to them. And, and cer certain attributes in rural communities act as multipliers, distance, sometimes uh, communication uh, issues, a feeling of isolation mm -hmm. at times. Um, when you think about the opioid crisis, for example, um, those issues can 
fester invisibly for so long um, until they explode into a full-blown crisis. And until that happens, one is clueless. But as we've seen from the opioid crisis, this really metastasized very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So how do you ensure that, that um, not only communities, by bringing people together, these 26 people, you're creating communica uh, communication, but how do you function as a way to take ideas from different community clusters and move them across Minnesota so that the ideas of one community can in fact, in a good way, mm -hmm. the actions of another? Mm -hmm. Well, a big part of what we do is we do communicate. So all of these 7,000 folks we talk about, they have access to all of our communications, whether that's our blog, um, other social media, or Facebook. So there's ways for them to share what they've learned. That's so, one. So you act as an information clearinghouse. Well, in many ways we do. And a connector. And a con much bridging is a big part of what we do. And there's so much good work that's happening, and how do we connect these? So that is... Again, that's one of the functions that I think we serve very, really do that pretty well. In terms of, of your 33 staff, how are they organized uh, mm -hmm. to deal with communication, but also you need, if you're going to be making grants, you need certain expertise mm -hmm. to evaluate a grant request. You have an administrative infrastructure. How, how, how are you organized? We have an administrative in infrastructure. We also have a grants team. We have a leadership team. We have a public policy and engagement team, which is pretty much our program team. And then we have a grants team. And a big part of what we do is when we work with a community, it's not just the grants team going in. It's not just the broadband. It's not just the, the leadership. How can we use our work collectively to best assist a community? So you're coming in with people who already have been exposed to some of these ideas that other communities have applied and then you're sharing that intelligence with that community, and then they decide to what extent these ideas are ap applicable to them? That's part of it. The other part is if you go into any community, they have their own ideas, but they don't always have the resources to carry them out. And if we can connect their ideas to the resources, whether that's leadership development, whether that's some grants, whether that's really focusing conversations in their communities. There's different ways that we have worked with communities so that they can figure out what it is that will make their community strong and vibrant and healthy. Now, there are different um, uh, ethnic groups throughout this region and different traditions, uh, different cultures. Talk about how you ensure that what you're, what you're doing and how you're communicating and the sensitivity. You know, I know with my background, as much as I listen, and as much as it is my job to talk with different people with different issues, there are sometimes things that I'm just not equipped to hear. Mm -hmm. It just is true, right? And being sensitive to, to your own deficiencies is part and parcel of listening. How do you ensure amongst your, your 33 people that you, are, you have people who can hear even the unspoken? You know, for the past, I would say at least 20 years, we have been working at our own internal culture. We have l looked at what is our intercultural competency of our organization and each of us as individuals. How does that evolve? How, how did you start? You start by just looking at your own culture. That's what we did. How can we start working? First of all, you look, if you have silos internally, you're not going to do your best work in terms of serving a community. Well, you started in 1941. The, the foundation actually was started in 90. So that, it must have looked a lot different in 1941. Oh, it was very different. The board, for example, at that time was all white males. Um, staff, as we evolved and actually was pretty much a, a white staff, and they made a concerted effort that we're going to, we're going to reflect the people that we serve. And that's what I think happened. So we that's started the change, having, right? The change is we started having women on the board. We are right now, we have evolved into the most diverse board that I have seen on any boards. And I've sat on numerous boards that exist. We have, we have so much that's reflected there in terms of um, race, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation. We've got, we've got like it all on our board. And the, the changes start at the top. The board actually said, we're going to include in our mission, our vision, our values, inclusion, equity. 
that's going to be embedded throughout everything that we look at and think. And it's tough. This is not easy work. We've been doing this internally for about 10 years, and it's changed the way we look at, at life. The 33 staff, it's pretty amazing. We have the, uh, the leader of our leadership program is Native American. I'm the president and CEO. I'm Native American. We have women throughout the organization in leadership programs, and we have men. We have a diverse group that works together that are committed to this change, but it takes a while to get there. Um, I kind of smile because we did this. There's an intercultural inventory you can take, which can kind of measure where you're at now and a whole pathway of where you want to go. It's called the IDI. And um, we took it and we scored like medium. We're kind of in minimization. Took it again, took it again, and kept doing all this stuff. And it took us years to move the needle, but we did. And once the needle moves as an organization, you look at the world differently. You're so much more curious. You don't jump to conclusions just based on what you think. And it's a really interesting place to be for an organization in terms of developing those muscles. Now we're starting to flex them. And what do I mean by that? We have policies in place now that we look at it through an inclusion or equity lens. For example, uh, we allow more time for moving religious holidays. We're even thinking, should we, we, can people work on Christmas if they're taking some other holiday off for what they believe? Um, we're looking at all of that sort of thing and how can we change to be accommodating to people and their beliefs? Not easy, no, but we think about it. We ask questions. What difference would this make? Does it really make a difference? And if the answer is yes, we have to find a way to do that. So our policies, the way we do business, we advertise every position now at the foundation so that people have an opportunity to apply. We still want the best people for the jobs, but there was a time when people like me, for example, may not even had a door open because things were set up that positions were filled before they even opened. Now we've said no. What we're going to do is we'll give this opportunity to all, not guaranteeing anything to anybody, but at least the processes are in place and the opportunities are there. Kathy and that, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Blanham Foundation, your grantees, your board members, your staff, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you.